Welcome to the Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Today with us is the Peterson Luddy Chair in Austrian Economics and a Senior Fellow at the Mises Institute, Mark Thornton. Welcome to the show. Michael, it's great to be here. It's great to be on your show. Thank, Thank you. you. So I want to talk today with you about my favorite economist, Ludwig von Mises. So before we get started, or I guess to get started, who was Ludwig von Mises? Well, that's a great question. It's a huge question, but he was an, an economist from Austria. Uh, he grew up in an intellectual household, uh, an ennobled household, actually. And he um, grew up a socialist, uh, went to university, um, decided to pursue a, a, you know, his doctorate in economics and uh, was fortunate enough to study under the early Austrian economist, uh, such as Bambavrik, and uh, that completely changed his outlook on economics and the economy and the world, really. And he adopted the methods and he adopted the economics of the what we now call the Austrian School of Economics. And, uh, and he kind of rewrote um, the whole of Austrian economics, making contributions to the very beginning of at the very beginning of his career and uh, really solidifying the methodology that we use today. And it is, he is personally so interconnected with the events of the 20th century uh, that it's an amazing life. He's an amazing man, uh, in addition to being one of the world's best economists of all time. In my view, the three most important contributions Mises made were in methodology, with his refutation of socialism, and his trade cycle theory. First of all, do you agree with my assessment? Am I missing anything? I mean, I know no, he made other contributions, but those I'd say were the top three. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, those are his most noteworthy contributions for sure. So you are spot on. Um, <clears throat> and it really relates to, to his major works, um, you know, in terms of length and in terms of, uh, the difficulty of analysis, he's really getting down into the nitty gritty. Uh, but Mises still also, I would just point out, also has some very uh, topical books and uh, things that are of a very general interest. But from the very beginning of his career, he was making groundbreaking uh, contributions. The theory of money and credit in the first decade of the 20th century um, did some amazing things. And I'll just list the fact that he solidified our knowledge about the origins of money, which he felt was critical, uh, knowing the nature of money. And in that book, The Theory of Money and Credit, he also pointed out the bad aspects of monetary systems and of government intervention into money. And only at the end of that uh, tremendous contribution does he really introduce the Austrian theory of the business cycle or the trade cycle, um, which he developed um, along with his students, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, Murray Rothbard, and many others uh, have developed and illustrated this theory over time. And I think that that's the thing that first attracted to me, I did as an undergraduate student, um, I did a directed readings course um, based on the theory of money and credit. And I, I actually found it incredibly difficult and I was fortunate enough to have a really good teacher, really remarkable in, in some sense that I had a teacher at an undergraduate school uh, that understood the theory of money and credit. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful. Uh, but that's the thing that first interested me. I, when I was, I think, 26, I came across a book called The Austrian Theory of the Trade Cycle. And it was essays by Rothbard, Hayek, Mises, and I think Gottfried Habeler. 
And I was struck by the logical precision and the force of the arguments they made. But the other thing that I thought was great about it is that Mises and Hayek, along with Benjamin Anderson, whose theory of the trade cycle seems very similar to me to that of Mises and Hayek, were able to predict the Great Depression. Their theory predicted it and explained it, whereas other economists at the time, like Irving Fisher or, or John Maynard Keynes, actually lost money in investments at the time because they didn't see the end coming. So to me, the theory not only, and I know Mises would hate that I, that I would bring up an, an empirical validation of his theory, but nonetheless, it, it had logical precision, the, the facts bore it out, but yet they don't they don't seem to get the respect in uh, economics that I think the theory deserves. But before that, can you just tell us what exactly is the Austrian or the Misesian theory of the trade cycle? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's basically an application of the Austrian theory of interventionism, which Mises pioneered and built throughout his entire career. He expanded that analysis. But um, the the trade cycle analysis or the business cycle analysis is a, in some sense, it's a straightforward application of that approach to government intervention where the government intervenes and it can do so in various ways, but basically the interventions lead to a decrease in the market rate of interest and an expansion of the supply of credit and ultimately the supply of money uh, in, an in an economy. And that sends signals to entrepreneurs and investors uh, to maybe to invest more because capital is inexpensive, uh, but also to engage in longer term projects because, you know, well, in finance, we know that um, when the interest rate is lower, your cost of borrowing is lower, but then that expands your time horizon for investments as well. So that essentially at a point in time when this intervention is going on, entrepreneurs and investors are investing in the wrong types of projects. Um, you know, the, the Austrian analysis is all about the price system and how it sends signals to all of the participants in terms of how to best participate in this conglomeration, uh, what Richard Cantian called the circulation. Um, and so as a consequence of that, we find entrepreneurs investing in the wrong types of projects or investments at a particular point in time. And when interest rates are allowed to, or essentially the market forces the hand uh, of banks and financial lenders, uh, capitalists and so on, uh, where the interest rate rises and uh, the real effects start to uh, come home in terms of basic supply and demand conditions. These uh, investments that once looked like they were great and they were making money, everybody was making money during the boom phase. Um, everybody had a job and so forth. All of a sudden, uh, reality reveals that these investments were bad investments to begin with, that they were too forward thinking, that they were adopting advanced technologies before their time. And as a result, uh, the economy goes into a slump or what Austrians call corrections. We're correcting the errors of the past, of the boom, really. And that's one of the things that is startling to a lot of people, a lot of listeners, is that the boom phase is actually where the problem is. That's where the mistakes were made. And the economy um, is, is basically forcing the hand of re-interjecting reality and, and then the realization of these bad investments so that, you know, people lose money, people go bankrupt, people um, get foreclosed on, and all of the rest of the things that are part of the corrective phase, even problems in the banking system itself. So the interest rate lowers 
artificially in, in essence by because of government intervention. So entrepreneurs now have more money available to them and are also willing to borrow more money because the, the interest rate is lower. So they have this money, but what causes them to invest in goods for consumption further in the future as opposed to right now? Because you said that they invest in longer projects. So they're they're putting their money basically in more capital intensive enterprises to produce uh, goods that are going to be consumed maybe a year, five years down the line. But what causes them to do that? And why is that a mistake? Well, I'm not a finance professor, but I do know from intro to finance that, you know, if you look at the financial models, which are a reflection of how people make money, um, you know, low interest rates encourage longer term uh, projects, longer term horizons and high interest rates are going to shift the market and investors decisions, entrepreneurial decisions towards more short run uh, phenomenon. So that an example of a very short run uh, investment opportunity would be like a hot dog stand uh, that you wheel around and sell hot dogs on the streets. Uh, that's something that can be, you know, produced relatively quickly and you could be right out on the streets selling hot dogs, earning revenue within just a matter of days of assembling that cart and uh, putting your business plan into operation so that the revenues are coming back very quickly um, and, you know, you're able to finance, uh, you know, pay the loan and pay, you know, your other costs of operation directly. Whereas a longer term project that benefits from low interest rates might be like the development uh, of a new pharmaceutical product or a medicine or a prescription drug um, where you know it's going to take a very long time, a period of years where you're going to have to hire scientists, you're going to have to establish laboratories, you're going to have to go through all sorts of gyrations in the lab and then in the testing process and then developing a marketing plan uh, and then, of course, adding to that, passing the FDA approval process. So you may be looking at um, a period of 20 years and a billion dollars of expenditures uh, to bring a product to market. And that whole 20 years, you're not bringing in any revenue at all. And the revenues only start to materialize long into the future. So you have to discount. Um, you know, let's say a million dollars or $10 million or a hundred million dollars, whatever it is that you expect your first year of revenues to be 20 years after you start the investment, uh, that has to be discounted back, you know, in time. Um, and as a result, you know, those future revenues uh, don't mean as much uh, to the pharmaceutical company uh, right now, the day of the investment compared to the hot dog stand where those dollars are current dollars, they're not future dollars. And so therefore they don't have to be discounted. And then of course the interest rate is the discounting factor. So, um, in, in all those respects and all those normal business respects that a lot of, of mainstream economists discount, uh, but that we can draw, directly uh, and adopt, you know, from finance uh, into uh, the Austrian theory, the Austrian approach, and, and show how broadly applicable uh, it is. And that tells us, you know, that falls directly in line with uh, what we see out there in the economy. Um, you know, it's the types of companies that get into trouble in the correction phase are typically companies that are investing uh, for the long term. And, uh, you know, so we look at the tech sector, you know, they, you know, start on ground, ground zero with an idea and, you know, they're going to develop a technology and they're going to, you know, develop a marketing plan and so forth. And it's going to take many years before 
any revenues uh, appreciate uh, to any great extent. And in course in tech, um, even after the company starts, you know, launching their product, typically they're not even making revenue off of them because the tech uh, sector is famous for giving away its products to begin with to develop its marketplace. And so you see this long-term perspective and long-term investments uh, behind them. And so that's where we tend to see greater volatility of stock market prices in comparison to a company that sells toothpaste or hot dogs, um, you know, where there's not a long developmental stage, uh, the raw materials come into the factory at one end and the finished products come out the other the same day. And uh, they're sold, they're even pre-sold uh, into the marketplace. So there's no time um, in those consumer good products, whereas the technological products take years or decades to develop and get to market. And so all of those revenues have to be discounted back. So isn't Mises's theory of originary interest as time preference, isn't that the key, though, to why they make this mistake? For instance, so if a lot of people are saving their money, which means that they're not buying now, they're buying later. So they have their money in the bank. When the bank has this excess of, of savings, they're going to lower the interest that they're willing to pay on those savings because they're not going to keep a high interest rate if they, they've got a ton of money and there's going to cost them too much money. But then also when they have this excess of money that when they loan, they lower the interest rate also. But in the case of when the federal government expands the, the uh, monetary supply or lowers interest rates, that's not actual savings. That's just an increase in the supply of money. So then entrepreneurs, don't they make that mistake saying, okay, there's all this saving going on. Therefore, people don't want stuff now. They want it later. later. And then they do what I think Von Balwer called, they lengthen the structure of production. They invest long term. Is my understanding accurate here? Oh, yeah. You're, you're understanding it perfectly. You know, Mises and Rothbard, Hayek and so forth, they always start with a story about really the free market economy and they develop a model of economic growth um, where it's really the decisions of everybody in the economy, including the just the normal middle class person who is saving for their future. They have a lower time preference for now. They're saving for the future. They're putting money in the bank. The bank may be lending that money for someone to build a house. They may be lending that money to businesses so that they can make payroll and inventory and accounts receivable. Um, or they may be investing in the new factory that's going to be put into town or whatever. But in all those cases, whether it's housing, uh, business operations, or new investments in capital tools uh, that's going to make a huge difference in this community, um, it's going to cause economic growth. So it's those day-to-day -day decisions that people make, the bourgeois sort of middle-class decisions to save um, for their business, to save for their future, to save for their retirement, to save for their children's education, and so on. They're putting money into the bank. That's fuel to the fire of or in the engine of economic growth. And so that's great. <clears throat> that's the real story of entrepreneurial growth where we're all participating and the growth is based on the decisions that we're all making in our head okay and that's the difficulty of translating our thoughts into bricks and mortar <clears throat> in the economy but that's essentially what's going on and we understood in fact i think we had an intuitive feel for economic growth um all along, even in all the misguided classical models of the economy. But it was really Mises uh, that really clarified what was disruptive in this process. How did government inflation uh, lead to a business cycle? And Mises showed that, well, by increasing credit, increasing the money supply, or artificially um, 
reducing interest rates in the economy, and really all three of those things simultaneously in most cases, um, that we artificially lowered the interest rate and we caused entrepreneurs to make different decisions than they otherwise would have. So instead of, you know, building uh, a factory that produced lumber uh, that per, would, would be used for housing and construction, um, that entrepreneurs were instead just, um, uh, tricked, really, uh, by the artificially low interest rates to invest in uh, some new technology that had never been thought of before, or maybe just a new pharmaceutical gut drug that was going to take a long time uh, to hopefully pan out for investors. Uh, and that's where you get into these uh, situations of business people, entrepreneurs being misled by an artificially low uh, interest rate, thinking that there is you know, a source of savings in the economy that's going to be there for a long period of time to sustain those longer term investments. And if it is the case that government has fooled these investors, then those investors are going to sustain a lot of losses. And the people who uh, maybe work for those companies are also, you know, being put at risk as well at the same time. So would a good summation of the Austrian theory be that in a free market, the interest rate is a function of the combined time preference of everybody interacting in the community? And as such, it acts as a coordinator between the present and the future and what goods should be produced over what period of time. And then when the government comes and intervenes in that, it disrupts the mechanism, causing it to send off false signals, which creates malinvestments, which ultimately create the bust. Would that be an accurate summation of the Austrian theory? Yeah, that's an accurate um, representation of the theory to the T. Um, you know, that is a summation. But I think listeners are probably right to conclude, well, that's a pretty complex theory <laughs> yeah. compared to everything else I've heard, you know on CNBC, yeah. you know, you know, those guys are pretty smart, yeah. but they're, they, they don't deal with the real complexities of human action the way Austrians try to. Yes. Um, you know, we, we try, we struggle, <clears throat> even the great minds, Menger, Bombavrik, Mises, um, Hayek, Rothbard, um, you know, these people, this was not, um, just something that it wasn't just common sense, right? That's, it's, it's a very complex set of complex relationships uh, that don't leave any, necessarily leave any visible footprints. We just get a few aggregate uh, statistics and we get market prices, but we don't know on the surface of it um, if those are market prices or those are prices in the market that have been artificially rigged yeah. in one direction or another. You know, we know when we walk into the store, well, the store says that, you know, milk is 389 a gallon. Um, and we know when it's put on sale, um, you know, we can read, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know really what's going on in terms of the production of milk or how it's produced anymore yeah. or any of those complex relationships, we have to rely on price, but we don't know going into our decisions, whether or not <clears throat> that's a pure free market price or some kind of uh, rigged, uh, manipulated, intervened price that's made its way to the marketplace for us to make our decisions on. Yeah. So it's really a misleading of the entrepreneurs who are really um, one of the most important groups uh, in the economy um, in terms of investment growth in, and business cycles. So we often hear that it's the free market or it's capitalism caused the Great Depression or caused the housing crash of 08 or deregulation caused SVB to go under. Now, in regards to the Great Depression, in my view, 
Mises Hayek, Benjamin Anderson predicted predicted it. I think Benjamin Anderson, Murray Rothbard, and Milton Friedman, you know, and others have gone a far way toward demonstrating that it was government intervention from the get go that caused the Great Depression. But even with that, it comes up again and again. So, do you believe that the Austrian theory of the trade cycle has explanatory power or is relevant to the crash of 08 or to what we're seeing now in the banking system or with the inflation that's going on? Oh, yeah, most definitely. And I've written about this um, many times, including the Great Depression, you know, who predicted it? Um, not everybody, but the main players who predicted it and who got it entirely wrong, like Irving Fisher, um, you know, he was America's great economist, um, kind of a precursor of the Chicago school, brilliant person, but he had the wrong theory. And Mises pointed this out. Mises wrote about Irving Fisher's monetary policy, uh, published a book in 1928. You know, so we have it. We have the evidence. And uh, I, I recount a lot of this evidence from the Great Depression through 08 in my book, The Skyscraper Curse, which I can uh, make available at least electronically to all of your listeners uh, for free. Um, and, you know, it's time after time. It's not like Austrians are great investors because um, you can have a good theory, but you need much more than a good theory uh, for a good investment. That's just a guide um, one guide to in investing. And, uh, but, uh, the Austrians thought enough of their theory that when <clears throat> big swings in the economy, when economic crises were eminent, the Austrians stepped forward time after time in the 20th century and uh, alerted people to the fact that monetary policy was, uh, was a bad idea um, at the time and that it would lead to trouble. And so starting with Mises, uh, even Hayek supposedly and, and others, uh, you know, that they were aware of an economic crisis, maybe not the Great Depression. Um, and, uh, and, and they also provided ways out, you know, what, what to do next. Uh, Murray Rothbard's America's Great Depression, I think, was the first book that had a profound um, influence on my own thinking. Uh, and it's a great, not only a, it's not only a great introduction to what happened during the Great Depression, um, but also the Austrian theory, he lays all that out in policy relevant terms. And uh, he also points out a lot of misconceptions about uh, Hoover and Roosevelt, uh, the politics of it all and why it went all so wrong. Um, and Austrians have continued to return to this uh, major event in history to, to, to make economic points about that. So yeah, I think in, you know, the housing bubble was certainly um, a case where a revival in the Austrian school that was occurring at the time and still is um, meant that many more Austrians stepped forward in their little ways because we're still very much a minority view. Uh, we don't get calls from CNBC. We don't get calls from Bloomberg and so forth uh, to be on the spot um, making these calls very often at all. Uh, you know, you may see Peter Schiff on TV once in a great while. You may see Jim Grant um, uh, on on uh, on TV once in a while, but that's very rare. And uh, so you really have to be attuned to um, other sources of information, such as this podcast, um, to to get fully informed. You got to realize that the mainstream media is aligned with mainstream economics and they're not in the business really of educating the general public in terms of what they need to know. Um, they're telling a story that um, is what the 
power elites, for a lack of a better term, uh, want you to know the limits of what you should know. And uh, that's what we're here uh, to try to do something about here at the Mises Institute. And um, so I, you know, would encourage everybody uh, to take a look at that book of mine uh, to see the record. Um, and I think that will speak uh, volumes uh, and uh, to see it in black and white uh, for yourself. So leading up to the, the housing bubble in 08, on, on one hand, you had government putting pressure on banks to loan to high risk borrowers for, for housing. They, 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 there was a big push. They wanted people to buy homes. So they put pressure on banks to rent to these homes. I believe it was even codified in the, in the uh, revisions to the Community Reinvestment Act. So they're putting pressure on them to make these loans. On top of that, the interest rates are dropping. So it's creating the the bad signaling that we're talking about. Plus, you had a moral hazard going on where banks would anticipate being bailed out should they fail. And you also had Fannie and Freddie, which are quasi-government agencies, buying up all these mortgage-backed securities. You know, these things all come to a head. The economy collapses. In, in the mainstream, you don't hear anybody talking about those things. All they're talking about is there's been all this deregulation, and that's that they threw out, uh, what was it? It's not Sarbanes Oxley. There's another one. I, it's not coming to my head right now that they threw out from the Depression era. And that gets all the, it, the blame. It's glass, glass steel. Glass steel. Was, yeah. Glass I steel. Yeah. That too. yeah. Glass steel. And there, and, but that's where the focus was. And I'm just thinking at the time, why doesn't anybody mention these other things? Because even if there were mass deregulation, which of course there wasn't, but even if there were, there's also all these interventions in the economy going on from the government. So at, at the least you would need a theory to explain what's causing what, but we had nothing. And similarly now, you know, during COVID, you had a situation where the government tells people they can't go to work then vastly increases the money supply, then gives everybody cash. At the time, I remember telling somebody, you're going to end up with an inflationary recession. I don't see how you're, you can avoid it. But they did it anyway, and then you get inflation and everybody's shocked. Why is this? Like, Why doesn't anybody pay attention to, I want to just say reality, but even beyond that, like you said, the Austrians don't get the call, despite their accuracy in predictions. Why not? Well, that's actually a fairly easy question because the, the power elites, uh, the people in control of things, and this includes, you know, the major banks, uh, it includes the major corporations, it includes all of the interest groups and the politicians that they support. Um, and of course, the big corporations own the media nowadays, too, so that they can uh, effectively edit everything that the mainstream media, television, newspapers, you know, uh, they, they, they all own all of that stuff. And so our news and information is severely edited before it ever gets to us. And, you know, the average American person uh, doesn't have the time to do this kind of deep analysis that's required to somehow uh, overcome all of this propaganda uh, in both in terms of telling you the wrong things, deleting out important things, and just gen generally massaging the data in favor always of the Federal Reserve's own story about the economy and the Fed's own story about the economy is essentially that the free market is, is careless, it's misinformed, it's greedy, it's all of these bad things, and it's unstable, of course, and it's only the Federal Reserve that comes in and fixes all, all this stuff. Now, of course, they tell us that they've regulated this stuff and that it can never happen again, and then... Uh, you know, it does happen again, and they say, well, you know, it's deregulation, it's greed, it's this and that and the other thing, um, when essentially they're just simply covering up uh, for the problems that they have caused themselves. 
you know, and you go back to Glass-Steagall, you know, that was um, a, a piece of legislation from the Great Depression designed to prevent banks from getting into areas that were too risky um, in lieu of the idea that the taxpayer was basically going to bail out the banks who got into trouble. And uh, Ron Paul, you know, that was an intervention into banking, but even Ron Paul said, you know, this is a piece of legislation, a, red, a regulatory guideline that doesn't need to be repealed, that shouldn't be repealed because it's designed to mimic something that would have existed in the marketplace in the absence of the Federal Reserve, um, their promise to provide an elastic currency and to provide a, a lender of last resort and all of that. Well, when you have the Fed in there um, causing all of these problems, Glass-Steagall was designed to, pro to provide a firewall uh, to limit the taxpayer's exposure. And since that was repealed, in the late nine, uh, in the late 1990s, um, we've seen the American taxpayer on the hook for you know problems with banking. And uh, what people are concerned with today is the tremendous extent that banks could be in trouble. We've seen a couple of banks fail. We've seen a couple of situations um, where trouble was obviously. Uh, existed in some bigger banks and, uh, you know, they've been able to massage this over, but at tremendous cost. I mean, they've already put the American taxpayer, um, they've exposed the American taxpayer to every single dollar of deposit and every single dollar uh, that banks have lent out, um, you know, to try to calm the marketplace but, um, you know, psychologically calming the marketplace is not going to do anything to fix some of the underlying fundamental problems that yeah. have been, which were developed uh, during the entire decade when the Fed had a zero interest rate policy. Yeah. Well, that's something people have already forgotten. See, here, and I, I like your analysis, but here is where I would disagree with Dr. Paul. In that you end up with this situation where the, it's understood that the government's going to bail the banks out. You have excessive taxation that's then going to you know, serve as the mechanism by which they bail them out. To me, the thing to argue with at that point is stop intervening. Stop the Fed from manipulating the currency. Stop the taxation. Stop the bailouts. But by saying, well, if we're going to have that stuff, then we're going to have to have Glass-Steagall, you're just growing the power of the state. And to me, that's the just the wrong approach to take. It's like the people that argue, for instance, well, we can't have open immigration because we have a welfare state, to, and then you're going to end up taking care of these immigrants when they come. To me, the argument should be end the welfare state and don't give them the benefits, the immigrants coming in, don't give them welfare benefits. But the state just continues to grow because we try to get these sort of fixes in or, or, or uh contrary mechanisms to balance off the previous sort of interventions. But I cannot let you go, uh, Dr. Thornton, before we discuss M Mises's absolutely brilliant, thorough refutation of socialism, especially when socialism is, you know, all in the vogue over the last 10 years or so with Bernie Sanders and AOC. So what, how, what was Mises's, the basics of it? How did he just completely destroy, and he did it theoretically, and that's important because people often say, well, socialism sounds good in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. But Mises demonstrated, no, it does not sound good in theory and it doesn't work in theory. So how did he do that? Well, let me set the stage. It's World War I, millions of people are dying. The communists have taken over Russia and uh, are developing a communist state where they've thrown off the economy. There's no entrepreneurs, they're all killed. Uh, all of the capitalists have been either imprisoned uh, or killed. Um, you know, banks, prices, wages, all of that is out the window and they're centrally directing this enormous landmass called Russia 
um, and its economy, and it's failing very badly. At the same time, Mises was wounded in World War I. He was an artillery officer in the Austrian military, and he was uh, wounded in battle, and he was back in Vienna recuperating. And uh, so, you know, the whole world is fighting over, um, you know, essentially politis how society will be politicized. And of course, the communists in, in Russia uh, were thought to represent the greatest threat. Now, Mises didn't think so. Mises thought, if, if, if you look at his analysis of, of economies and war and so forth, he realized that the Russians were not really uh, much of a threat. And so his analysis was, what would happen to a relatively free market economy if <clears throat> you did away with private property, which the communists wanted to do, uh, money, wages, prices, so on and so forth, and you replaced it with central planning and central directing of the economy and everything involved. And what he showed was that when you have one great owner of everything, including the people and the workforce and so on, uh, there's no property and there's no real exchange. There's not, there's nobody who's making decisions about um, economic transactions that are self-motivated except for basic uh, consumption items like apples or a gallon of milk or a chicken, um, where barter still existed in the Russian economy. And Mises said, well, that economy is economically irrational and economically impossible in the sense that there is no real private property, therefore there's no real exchange or trades, there's no real prices. So if there's no real prices of consumer goods and natural resources and capital goods, then nobody really understands the economic significance of anything in the economy. You could, you could be you know, basing your decisions on what existed prior to communism. You could be basing your decisions on what you see in market economies next door. But if you were truly on your own, you'd have no idea on how to do anything that involved investments. Um, and as a matter of fact, Mises said, was asked one time, you know, what's the fundamental difference between capitalism and socialism, in this case, communism? And he said, well, there's no stock market. Uh, and what he was trying to focus his answer and the attention of the person questioning him was that, you know, you might be able to mimic the market economy on Main Street, but you could never get to the economic rationalism that exists in the capital structure of the economy. And so you would be systematically wasting resources, which communism and socialism is famous for. And, you know, that's basically the dividing line. And of course, Russia suffered so tremendously during World War I and directly after, of course, by the war, but also from communism. And millions of people died of starvation, a basic uh, lack of basic um, uh, subsistence. Uh, in their economy, even places that weren't directly impacted by the war. And so the, the Russians, the Russian communists had to rethink, they had to pivot uh, early in their tenure uh, as dictators of Russia, that um, they would have to uh, more or less concede Mises's point, at least with respect to the existence of prices and wages, um, you know, businesses that sold products, uh, businesses that um, hired and used labor, uh, all they had to at least mimic uh, the market economy. And then they would use um, 
historical information uh, regarding technology and uh, production possibilities, uh, production functions actually was what mainstream economists call it, but how to do things. And of course, they also could use prices in international markets as a guideline. So they had to pivot completely away from communism and adopt uh, a more middling type of socialism. Otherwise, their dictatorship uh, of those areas would simply crumble from the fact that they couldn't feed their people. Which is why you in Russia ended up with the new economic program and, you know, all their modifiers because it just wouldn't work. So to just try to sum up Mises' theory and what you just said, the, the essence of the, his critique of socialism is that prices send signals. So if prices are going up, the entrepreneur knows to direct his activity or her activity to that area because that's what people want. Whereas if prices are dropping, you know, okay, this is something people don't want, so you don't produce it. But in a communist or a socialist country, there is no private property. There is no prices. So there's no signaling telling anybody what actually needs to be produced. So these central boards or whoever they are, they decide what needs to be produced, which is why in Russia, you end up with bread lines a mile long and warehouses stocked with stuff that nobody wants. Yes, I know. And, and unfortunately, you know, the current generation doesn't have a lot of the same experience that I had um, or that I was able to search out and find because a lot of that was being covered up. I mean, you know, we were mortal enemies with the Soviet Union. And yet, for some reason, they had to come begging for grain for their people. I mean, um, you know, so it was there was a lot of questions that if you were uh, thinking about it, you might investigate, you might see that, you know, 40 percent of their food came from uh, people's private backyard gardens and, and raising chickens and things like that. You wouldn't otherwise you wouldn't know that the Soviet Union was badly failing. In fact, I, I really didn't. I was snowed in by the whole story, too. I mean. Um, I was told that, you know, the Soviet Union was growing economically, <laughs> and so in the textbook, and, uh, and one of my teachers would bring in these uh, graphs which showed, you know, the Soviet Union uh, not only had more tanks than us, but they were making more tanks than us, and, you know, the, the whole story uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and even into the eight, 1980s, right before the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and Eastern Europe uh, was able to free itself, uh, you know, mainstream economists were saying that the Soviet Union was overtaking the U.S. in terms of uh, its economy and economic performance. So, you know, understanding that the, that the Soviets and the communists really were desperate, they were in a desperate situation that their people no longer you know, the, the second, third, and fourth generations away from the revolution, um, it, it was very difficult for them to believe uh, living in this socialist paradise <laughs> that uh, people had to wait in line and, for bread and, and might not get any. Um, you know, the desperate situations of uh, socialism were revealing themselves and yet the, the American media and the American public were largely ignorant of what was going on, even the CIA. Now, we're not sure if they really knew and they were just making this stuff up or if they were fooling themselves, which is more likely. Um, they also thought that we were in deep doo-doo, deep trouble. And uh, it was all uh, really a figment of the communist imagination uh, that Americans were being misled purposely because of uh, the necessities of the Cold War, basically. And um, that turned out to be one of the greatest myths of the 20th century. All right, Dr. Thornton, before we go, is there anything we left out, anything you wanna add? Well, you know, like I said, we, I'd like to give everybody 
a copy of my skyscraper curse book. Okay. And I'd love everybody to just come to our website, M I S E S dot O R G. And you could subscribe, uh, to our daily articles, uh, our events, uh, our podcasts. Um, we have the world's largest economic web page, and it's written in a way um, for the general reader, uh, by and large. And it's a great source of information, and it's a great way to counter the disinformation that we face um, on a day-to-day basis. So thank you for very much for having me on. Thank you for being here. And let me just say, I read the uh, articles from the Mises Institute every day. And a lot of good stuff that goes contrary to what you're, you're going to hear anywhere else. Very uh, persuasive, to say the least. Dr. Thornton, thank you so much for being here. I hope to have you on again. Great guest. For now, I'm the Rational Egoist, Michael Leibowitz, signing out. Remember, like, comment, share, and subscribe.